uh, our first speaker, Zayda Mugabe, with Mothers Out Front. She's research director for HEAT and serves on the National Health Impacts Team of the Gas Leaks Task Force for Mothers Out Front. She recently coordinated the Mothers Out Front team and led a large volume leak study that resulted in methane emissions reduction policy change within the largest gas utilities in the state. She also serves on Envision Cape in Cambridge, is completing a master's in sustainability, and is a mother of three, ages 14, 12, and 7, who she says still let her teach gardening at their school. Zainab, thank you for being here today. Please welcome our leadoff speaker, Zainab Magabi. Good morning. I'm actually really, really happy to be here today on a Saturday morning and uh, pretty happy too that my job is to tell you a story. It's a good way to start the morning. Uh, I have to be clear that I, as you might have guessed, kind of have worn multiple hats in this story and I'm not going to tell you the science part. I'm going to tell you more the organizing part. Um, and I hope that it can help you be hopeful because this story and this experience has helped me be deeply hopeful in challenging times. And it starts, like all of us do, with a mother. So when my children were born, I went a little bit crazy about chemical exposures in my home. And I fervently threw out flame retardant filled mattresses and baby bottles with hormone disruptors, and I renovated the house myself with non-toxic paints and caulks, and in the end, I was satisfied. I had done what I could to protect my children in my home. But outside my home, our climate, I was totally beat. It was too big, it seemed impossible for me to take on. But when one mom, worried about her children's future, gets together with another mom and another mom, and then there's thousands of moms, you get Mothers Out Front. And Mothers Out Front is an organization that started around the kitchen table in Cambridge with a group of friends like these women. They decided to use their mother's voices and their mother's networks to grow the power needed to protect their children's future. I went to one of those house parties they had, and they followed up with a one-on-one. -on -one. This is the growth strategy. So a one-on-one -on -one is very highly technical. It involves sitting down and listening to the other person, <laughs> hearing their concerns, their enthusiasms, and asking them to do one small thing to help. <coughs> and where it leads is that before long, you find you're doing a lot more than one small thing. I was really struck through the whole process of getting involved that every meeting was a positive experience that left me feeling a little bit lighter, a little better about myself and my fellow humans. No one dominated the airspace. No one shamed or blamed. There was even a norm to ensure that all voices were heard. Step up if you're quiet, step back if you're not, you know who you are. Everyone has something to add, and everyone is important. So what ended up happening was that the laughter and kindness balanced the passion and urgency of the challenge. In other words, the human relationships, the human experience are the foundation of this grassroots organization, and that's where the power is. So this is an organizational chart. You don't have to read it, I promise. So, Community organizing teams are connected to each other and to state organizing teams and to task forces and to other states. And again, to be clear, the, the power resides and the action resides in the community organizing teams in the hands of the volunteers. And all the elements of the organization, now in nine states five years later from that kitchen table, are interconnected in a vast network. I just put this up to give you the idea of the messiness of the network. Um, and what does this actually end up looking like? It looks like that. Um, 
It looks like moms and their kids coming together to speak truth to power, raising their voices and telling their stories of care and concern for the children's future. So shortly after I joined, one of the moms in Cambridge shared her discovery with everyone that there was leaking methane from pipelines under our streets and that the climate impact was enormous. We had no idea. That was, that was pretty interesting. Uh, oh, uh, you get to see the methane, which most people don't. <laughs> um, and for those of you who haven't heard about this, natural gas, which is what we pipe under, is 97% methane. Methane is 86 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide in the first 20 years. And even a tiny bit of lost methane has a huge climate impact. So in our state, nat the natural gas leaked into our atmosphere was enough annually to add up to 10% of our greenhouse gas footprint. So this was huge. So we didn't, as I mentioned, know anything about natural gas, methane, pipelines. Uh, so we reached out to uh, some local organizations working on this and began to meet and talk about what to do forming new alliances. But 16,000 leaks deprioritized across the state is a lot of leaks, <laughs> even for a lot of moms. Uh, so, so when research was published showing that just 7% of those leaks are emitting half of all the methane, we had a plan. Find and fix those largest leaks first. We decided here in Cambridge that we do our part by making the invisible visible. Yep. Labeling all 231 gas leaks in Cambridge. And yes, they're still there. Oh, there's one on Oxford Street. Um, so <laughs> this got us a lot of attention. Uh, Boston Globe, Living on Earth, and the idea spread fast. Other community teams started tagging to momentum built. Enough power and momentum that just four months later, the state legislature passed a law requiring the prioritized repair of environmentally significant leaks. So doesn't that sound like the end of the story? No. <laughs> well, you're right, no, because <laughs> Because we haven't met any energy execs left yet, left yet, right? And that was in the title. So um, we have to meet the energy execs. And what happened is we found out that the utilities actually had no idea how to find the biggest leaks. They, <laughs> they had, size had never mattered before, at least in gas leaks. And it, <laughs> They just cared about whether it might explode. That was their focus, which, which is good, which is good. So, um, <laughs> so uh, you know what, I'm just gonna wait uh, So we didn't know exactly how to approach this, but we had our model, our way of doing things. So without really thinking about it, we took that relationship-based network and growth model, and we stepped it outside of our comfort zone. We reached out to each of the largest utilities in Massachusetts and asked them to work with us to find those big leaks. So three of us walked into a conference room at Eversource Gas, three moms, and sat down across from three utility execs. Yes, they were all now, including William Akeley, the president of Eversource Gas. We started the way we knew how to do. We introduced ourselves and we told them stories about our kids. Uh, probably that doesn't usually happen in that conference room. So um, he, and, and we told him why, how we were doing this work because of our kids. And he paused, he kind of looked at us, and then he responded by telling us about his three kids and about how his youngest is pretty worried about climate change. We told him then why we wanted to make sure those largest leaks were found and fixed and how he could help. And he said yes. 
to our entire proposal. And that was the beginning of a new and pretty unusual alliance. And we calmly walked out of Eversource headquarters to our zip car, got in, calmly closed the doors, and then we started screaming wildly in excitement. <laughs> 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 but Columbia Gas said yes too. And after a statewide Twitter storm featuring some creative gas leak suits, <laughs> National Grid said yes too. So is that an alliance or reluctant alliance or what? Uh, we just saw it as a beginning an opportunity to get to know each other. And to do that, we had to get in the door. So guess the suits were born. Um, so this is our ecosystem. I know it's not the kind of ecosystem that you were expecting to hear about, but this is the ecosystem we built by that January 2017. Alliances at all levels, individual, organizational, inter-organizational, and at every level, based entirely on respectful and caring one-on-one -on -one human relationships. At this point, I can only describe what happened as things began to accelerate. It's, it's hard to describe the pace and the feedback and the connections and the growth and the ideas and the information, but they just started to flow really rapidly through a number of us in the middle of it all. And it was an experience unlike I have ever had. <laughs> It, you, people talk about flow state, and it was kind of like a group flow state. Um, so I wanted to share a little story to try to give you a taste of what happened. We didn't have a uh, tool to directly measure the flux of the leak and repair. You don't have to worry about what that is. What matters is we had all the information and expertise we needed to co-create that tool if we just pulled it together. So we did, and we went from idea of, hey, we need something that does this, to product in two months. And this experience was not just extremely fast and effective. <laughs> it was, I, I could, it was seamless and beautiful, and it was a collective act of creativity. And it was fun along the way. Um, th this is in a back uh, lot testing volume. This is Brian Ferry, who, was, who volunteered to manufacture it. Um, there's the utility guys testing it for the first time. Uh, the pride of Kevin Kelly of Eversource for his innovative suggestion to model it on an existing truck tool. The strategy and care of Dan Cody of Columbia Gas working out how to make it easy for the workers to use. The energy of the hackathon design session at MIT, picking apart the physics of it. The generosity and humor of Brian Ferry of Millibar, who manufactured it locally, voluntarily. The whole experience was just really different. <laughs> and that kind of sums up the whole large volume leak study. From start to finish, it was groundbreaking. <laughs> um, uh, and right there in it with us were our utility partners in this project. And it wasn't at all always easy. And I don't want to give you that impression. It was sometimes really awkward, sometimes totally exhausting, and sometimes it went entirely in the wrong direction. And a lot of the time, we looked at each other and were, what are we doing? <clears throat> but the utility, co you know, I have to just say something about this picture. U utility companies, and they are, this is self-admitted, are, are really, really risk-averse, slow-to-change organizations. And they literally use some of the same tools used in the 1800s with John's maps. <laughs> I'm sorry, not to forget that part of it. Which is, actually kind of awesome and, and a good idea because power tools and explosive gas are not a good mix. So um, I promised no details on the study. Uh, so I'm going to summarize the entire study by saying 
it worked. Uh, we disproved the proposed technique as totally useless. We found an easy way to pick the largest leaks fast, and the flux bar worked too. And I could talk about the details of the science for hours, but I can also tell you stories from the field for even longer. One guy told us about how his grandfather had been in gas, how he had started at 16, become a member of a gas organization at an early age. This man loved his job and the gas system. He made it, he built his life around it. Another guy spent hours explaining to me how different repair techniques were done as we waited for the backhoe out of their job site. I, went, I, I, I learned a lot every step of the way, and so much of what I learned, I learned from those unlikely allies. And uh, I've heard back that they've learned a bit too. So at the end of the study, and this is supposed to be really messy, um, we held a summit at MIT called Common Ground on Common Partners. And it was kind of like an unveiling of the system we had built together, sharing the story and showing everyone the extent of what they were part of. And we didn't just gather, we announced a plan. Banking on the trust we had built and backed by thousands of concerned moms and citizens, we came to an agreement with the utilities to change the method of finding the leaks accelerate the timeline for fixing them, verify them with the flux bar, share the data with us in a transparent way, and reassess the process anyway. So that was cool. <laughs> um, this is my... <laughs> so this is, uh, this is Bill Akeley, my buddy Bill. He's the president of Eversource Gas. And he's the guy who told me about his three kids that first meeting and that first Eversource meeting. And here we are in October, speaking about the experience of seeking solutions together. And he got up in front of that crowd and he said, you know, <laughs> before that first meeting, he'd been asked if he needed lawyers and bodyguards <laughs> <laughs> to meet with us. And he said, no. But he admitted he was kind of nervous about the meeting. But we had listened. And we didn't yell at him, he said. And that made all the difference. In fact, his quote was, if you start with a poke in the eye, what you get back is a poke in the eye. But if you start the way they did, what you get is you end up here. Okay. So another messy chart. I like this one a lot. Um, so this is one way of looking at our crazy journey. I kept trying to find ways to tell the story, and it's not that easy because it's really complicated. Um, but this is last year. And the problem with the story is there's no end point. It's unfolding and evolving every day, and there are more and more leaders in the middle of it helping to convene and connect. So even though the three utilities and all of us activists together submitted a, our plan to the Department of Public Utility and jointly testified. The DPU has not yet enacted the regulation. We're waiting. Despite this, all three of these utilities, and this is 95% of gas customers in the, in the state, to be clear. They got together in February and together wrote the protocol for the new worker training needed to follow our plan. They are upgrading their computer systems to take the new data. And this month, April, dig season opens. And their leak surveyors are out using our technique. The same crew that drove through the night, that's another story, to testify with us at the DPU because their plane was canceled from Ohio, sorry. Yeah, exactly. Like, they drove through Ohio through the night. But um, they are the ones, and from Columbia Gas, they, they are the ones that called the meeting to write the protocol. We didn't have to. We also didn't set up a meeting last month with the yard and crew chiefs of the operations department at Engrid. The head of operations did that and asked us to come explain to them all about our study and what it means and what they can do. 
the room, it was another one where we walked in and we're like, what are you doing here? The room was packed full of big guys. <laughs> and, and their boss started out by saying, I know you have an idea of what environmentalists are like, but I've been working with these two for the past year, and it isn't like that. I really want you to listen to what they have to say. So they did. <laughs> and then it was time for questions. And the guy next to me had taken some notes on a spiral notebook, and he wanted to check had he heard right that methane was 87 times more potent than carbon dioxide in the first 20 years? Wow. Then a young guy said, hey, can we use the flux bar quantification to get offset payments so we can put more money into fixing more of them? Ooh. And a yard chief, really enthusiastic, he wanted to suggest that keyholing the bare steel, you know what I mean? might be the way to get the most methane reductions fastest. So, in other words, the movement is in good hands, and the alliances continue to grow. In fact, that meeting, I was thinking about afterwards, it wasn't essentially different than a mother's out front house party. <laughs> and the call to action, that was the same. So this is my youngest daughter. And her sign reads, when I grow up, I'm going to save the world for everyone. And I know everyone here is, feels about the same way she does. But the question has been how. How are we going to affect the scale of change that is needed? How are we going to do this thing we all know we need to do? And what I learned the last year is that we actually have a lot of unrealized power and potential that we didn't know we had. That the pace of change can accelerate rapidly. That unlikely alliances, relationships, networks of people with a common purpose. I think this is where the answer is. In the world around us. So when we wanted to fix the gas system, we went and worked with the gas system. If we want to restore the planet, we need to work with the existing ecosystems all around us. Learn from them like we learn from the gas guys. Support them where they need support. Support their capacity to heal their own system and us. So I believe my daughter, but I say this all the time, I'm sure is now hell not going to leave it all up to her. Um, so thank you all for being here today, and thank you for seeking solutions together.